Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, May the 30th, 2022. It is currently 1041 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from Abilene, Texas. Now, ever since the SBC released the report about sexual, ab- about sexual abuse within the Southern Baptist Convention, there have been articles, I mean, one article after another written about it, and everyone offering their thoughts, everyone offering their opinions, everyone offering maybe their, their solutions. There, there's been all kinds of articles exploring the entire situation, exploring the horrible, horrible scandal from so many different perspectives. And I've been collecting all of these articles thinking about, okay, how many of these articles do I want to talk about? How many of these articles do I want to turn on the microphone and work through them and analyze their perspective, critique it, offer my own How much coverage do I want to give to this absolutely horrific situation? Now, I have mentioned the SBC report in sermons and in podcast episodes, so I have talked about it. I have mentioned it. I talked about how upsetting it is, how horrible it is, how, how I mean, just it's, it's emotionally disturbing even to read. So I have, I have mentioned it some, but I've just kept debating with myself. So, so if I turn on the microphone, what can I offer to this horrible situation? What, what can I add to it? So I, I still have not decided what my coverage of the situation will be moving forward because there's so many other things that we attempt to do. I, I, I try to keep the Theology Central podcast as balanced as as much as possible, right? I don't want it to just be news commentary. I don't want it just to be criticizing what's going on in the world of Christianity. I also like it to be, well, Bible study exercise, devotional messages. I I like it to, to be a mixture of things so we're just not one thing, but we are many things, and all of these things are important and contribute to people's spiritual growth. That is what we attempt to do, and obviously the main focus is trying to make theology central to whatever we do talk about. So what what can I add to this very horrific situation? I think some people would prefer not to talk about it. I think some people would just prefer, well, that's horrible, especially if you're not a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. You can kind of just look at it and go, well, not, not our problem, but it is a problem. It is a horrible problem, and there's so many different perspectives that we could talk about. But I was very much intrigued when I received a notification that an article had been posted at crosswalk.com. And the headline reads, Why is abuse rampant in the church? Now that caught my attention. Because this article wasn't just going to just give us all the horrible details that are found within the SBC report. This doesn't appear to be an article that's simply going to you know, condemn it and tell you how bad it was and who failed and, and, and everything like that. It's not even really an article. It appears to, according to the headline to try to be saying, you know, here are the solutions. No, it seems to be an article dedicated to answering the deeper question. Why is abuse rampant in the church? So the article puts forth the idea that sexual abuse is just rampant within the body of Christ. And I think that is something that many Christians will need to face and come to terms with. Well, is, is abuse far more rampant, far more widespread than anyone wants to think about, anyone wants to pretend, any, anyone even wants to admit or talk about? And if so, well, then you have the deeper question, why? Why is it so rampant? Now, we could ask a, 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 a bigger question. Why is sexual abuse, why is abuse rampant within the culture? Well, like, I, I, think, I think this is a, a, a societal, cultural issue more than just a church issue. And, and think about this is very important. I think theologically and biblically that we should always expect, always expect that whatever we see happening in the culture will be present in the church. 
I mean, all you have to do is open up a Bible, start reading in the New Testament, and it doesn't take you very long. You're going to come to a book, say 1 Corinthians, and you're going to realize 1 Corinthians is a letter written to a church located in a city. The city is influencing the church more than the church is influencing the city. All the, the sin and ungodliness in the city is inside the church. The body of Christ is not immune to cultural influence. The body of Christ follows the culture in some way, shape, or form. We can say, no, we don't, we shouldn't. We, we, can, we can talk all we want, but over and over and over. If divorce is, is bad in the culture, divorce is bad in the church. If there's abuse in the culture, there's abuse in the church. If there's pornography use outside the church, there's pornography use inside the church. If there's adultery outside the church, there's adultery inside the church. You name, If there's fornication outside the church, there's fornication inside the church. If, what if, if there's domestic violence outside the church, there's domestic violence inside the church. That's the way it is. And I know Christians always put forth a picture and an image that that's not the case. And that's where I believe the problem really is, is that so much of Christianity is nothing more than performance art where we pretend to be something that we're not and we create a theology where we can claim that we are something that we're not when the real reality, when you pull back the curtain, when you take off the mask, when you pull back the, all, you pull away all of the performance art and you see the reality, it's not near as pretty and as godly and as wonderful as everyone thinks that it is or everyone pretends that it is. Now, I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I'm already giving you my perspective. But but when I saw that there was an article going to go to the deeper issue of why, hey, you 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 got my attention. However, as I read the article, I was somewhat perplexed because I didn't feel the article even attempted to answer the question. Maybe it did. You can draw your own conclusions. And what I want you to do as we go through this article, I want you to just think, I don't want you to grab a piece of paper, and I want you to just write down what you think are what the major issue, the major reason, or the, the major reasons, plural. Try to come up with two or three reasons you think that explains why abuse is so rampant in the church. Now, I'm going to get some emails saying, it's just not, it's not in the church, it's not in the church, it's not in the church. And you can live in that denial, but at, at some point, you're going to, one day you're going to look around and realize the church, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mess, and it always has been, and it always will be. But again, that's a different, that, I'm giving, I'm, I'll probably try to come back to that, because I have a very strong opinion on this that I think is missed in so much of the coverage, all right? But here we go. So why is abuse rampant in the church? We're going to work through a little bit of this article, and but the main thing we're going to focus on is the reasons they give. They give how many here? Or supposed reasons. One, two, three, four. They give four. They're supposed to explain or supposed to answer why is abuse so rampant in the church? Here's how they start off. All right, here we go. This was posted on May the 24th. I don't know why I got a notification later on. Maybe it showed up somewhere else. I don't I don't remember all the details. I just know as soon as I saw it, I saved it in my notes. It's like, we're going to get back. I don't know what else I'm going to talk about in regards to the SBC report, but I'm definitely going to talk about this because here's an article that explains why it's occurring. And I want to know the reason why. All right, so here we go. I quote, this morning, I had a headline pop up on my phone. Here's the headline that popped up on their phone. Now, and I know if you, if you, if I don't know about your mobile device, but I have my mobile device set up to try to get, I want all the podcast notifications I can and all the news notifications I can because I like keeping up what's going on in the world. And I like knowing every time a new podcast drops, basically if any podcast that can be produced anywhere in the world, I want a notification because I like to listen and see what's going on in the world. So I get these notifications all the time. In this particular case, the author of this article what, um, had a headline pop up on their phone, and this is the headline they read. Bombshell, 400-page report finds Southern Baptist leaders routinely silenced sexual abuse survivors. They silenced them. So, so their headline doesn't even go to that it happened. Not only did it happen, they silenced the sexual abuse survivors because they wanted to keep it quiet. They wanted to cover it up. Not a fun headline. Not a pleasant headline. Doesn't even sound like a news article that I want to read or talk about, but it's something that we have to face. 
The, the author of the article goes on to say, I clicked on the link out of curiosity as to what, uh, to what the secular news agency had to say, knowing that there's often a bias against Christianity. Now, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, it, it, uh, Christians are... It, oh, okay. Christians really have this mindset that if anyone publishes a news article that's somewhat critical of Christianity, okay, reports the the dirty laundry of Christianity, immediately is like, well, they have a bias against Christianity. It's almost like this persecution complex. How dare they report this bad stuff about us? How dare they do? I, they've got a bias. It's bias. And it's like, why, why is it that as soon as any bad reporting comes out in the quote-unquote secular media about what's going on in Christianity, it's bias, it's an attack, and it's persecution. But if that same news media was to report something bad about, say, what's happening within Catholicism or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness or uh, Islam, we, we don't go, oh, I bet you they're biased. I bet you they're biased. No, we're like, look how messed up Islam is. Look how messed up Mormonism is. Look how messed up Catholicism is. Isn't it amazing? When, when, when the reporting is pointed at us, oh, it's fake news. It's, per, it's persecution. It's bias. I hate that mentality. I, I, I really do. And even if they have a bias, if the, the issue is, is the reporting accurate and true? It doesn't, even if they offer strong opinions that you think are not fair, the issue is the reporting true. But we've bought into this, it's almost become a narrative. If you don't like the reporting, it's fake news. If you don't like the reporting, it's because it's biased and, it's, and therefore you can't trust it. And I, I man, I am... It's amazing how we how how that has become such a, a common thing. But okay, so this person, hey, they, they just clicked on it out of curiosity because they know often a bias that the secular media, secular news agencies have a bias against Christianity. Then they continue though. However, comma, like most of you, I know there has been sexual abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention and all religious denominations. How do I know? Because I experienced it within my own marriage to a Southern Baptist pastor. All right. So they begin to describe a little bit of their own personal situation. I'm not going to go through the, the details of their, their personal situation because, again, the headline is why is abuse rampant in the church? Now, my, well, as soon as I started reading about them explaining their situation, I'm like, okay, are they going to take what happened to them and somehow extrapolate from their experience as to here's the answer to why it's happening and all and, and denominations across Christianity? Or, is that going to be their approach? Or because they experienced abuse, did they then dedicate years of study to the subject and been able to then take from that here are my findings. So I was very curious because when you write a headline saying, why is abuse rampant in the church? The reader is expecting an answer to that question. So we have, here's the report I saw. I know this is happening because I've experienced it. They describe their experience. And then here's the lead in paragraph, right? Here's the paragraph that really sets it up. You ready? Why is abuse so rampant in the SBC? Why is abuse so rampant in the church? While I am certain it is multifactorial, I can share a few things that I have come to realize over the years. So, okay, I'm sure that there's a lot of different you know, there, it, it, there's lots of factors. It's, it's multifactorial. There's lots of factors here, right? Lots of factors. Okay, wonderful. They just say, I'm certain of that. They don't say how they're certain of that. They're just, hey, there's a lot of different factors. I'm certain of it. They don't tell us what all of those different factors are. And it says, I can share a few things that I've come to realize over the years. So this is what this person has come to realize. I don't know if this is extensive study, extensive research, or again, just taking from their own personal experience. But I, I get this is odd. Now, this was posted at crosswalk.com. So a lot of Christians are going to see this. And I, I'm just a little baffled, like, okay, I mean, if I was to write an article, why 
abuse is rampant in the church, I would hope I could come with some really substantial information that would help us unpack the mystery, be able to, to figure out, because if we can figure out the why, that would go a big, wouldn't that go a, uh, be a big help in preventing it in the future? If we can really un, unravel and, 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 un, and discover the why, I, I think that that would be important. Let's see if they offer any reasons. Here we go. Number one, we deal with fallible humans and not an infallible God. We deal with in, with fallible humans and not an infallible God. Okay. <laughs> Just as I read that, I tried to read that somewhat the way I read it the very first time. I was like, wait, we deal with a fallible humans and not an infallible God. So the reason abuse is so rampant in the church is because we... I guess believers, we deal with fallible humans and not an infallible God. Are, are they saying the reason it's so rampant is because the church is made up of fallible humans? Is that, is that, it's just really written really weird because we deal with fallible humans and not an infallible God. But okay, I think I know what they're saying. At least when I read the, 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 the title here for this point, Okay, so you're saying the church is made up of fallible humans and that fallibility will constantly manifest itself and it's manifesting itself currently and many and, and, and it's being exposed as sexual abuse. Okay, L let's see what they have to say here. I know many of us long to be like Jesus, but we simply are not. Our example was perfect in every way. He knew how to model grace and truth. He could read hearts and direct people. He could see the deceit in the hearts of men. They have a reference to Jeremiah 17, 9. And direct them where he willed, Proverbs 21, 1. However, our earthly experience are with sinful men, not our sinless Savior. Not one of us is without sin. And that includes the leaders who are supposed to be teaching us to be more like Christ himself. They are sinners and we can be certain that they will one day be judged more strictly. Even though we often put spiritual leaders on a pedestal, they are humans and sinners just like we are. All right, so this is the, why is abuse so rampant? Well, because people are sinners. Now, on one hand, I strongly agree with that, but I'm going to put forth an argument here because this bothers me a little bit, all right? Because if I listen to the evangelical world, if I listen to sermon after sermon, Christian podcast after Christian podcast, and we have talked about this so many times that I think I've already received emails telling me people to stop talking about it because they're tired of hearing it. But I feel like I can never stop repeating it because this is so relevant, I think, to this issue. While I agree that the reason we're going to see sinful action in the church is because the church is made up of sinners, sinners who still have a sinful nature, and that sinful nature manifests itself sometimes in very horrific and horrible ways. I completely agree with that. But there is a teaching in the evangelical world that constantly, in my estimation, denies that reality or tries to pretend that's not the reality that we actually experience. Because over and over in evangelical churches, you constantly hear this refrain. When you became a Christian, you became a new creature. Old things are passed away. Everything has become new. And that is not just true positionally. That is true in your practice. You have been set free from the power of sin. You've been set free from the bondage of sin. You now can obey God. You've been given the Holy Spirit to give you the power to obey. You've been given the Holy Spirit. So now you can say no to temptation. You can say no to sin. This is the constant refrain in the evangelical church. You have power. You've been changed. Well, when you hear that over and over and over, then you have to start pretending. You have to start pretending. No, 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 no. I can overcome temptation. I can overcome sin. I don't need any help. I can, I've got the power of God in me. I've been transformed. I've been changed. The old is completely gone. So there's no excuse for it. Well, this creates an entire this creates an entire atmosphere within the body of Christ 
where everyone has to put on the fig leaves and put on the pretend because I'm supposed to be so radically different. So we have to minimize many sins and try to pretend, well, that's not, I mean, I mean, it, it's not that it's perfection, but I'm going in the right direction. And we have to continue to try to explain away our, our sinful actions and thoughts and failures. We have to try to explain it away because we can't face it head on. Because why do you continue to sin if the old is completely gone and everything is new? That would be the eradication of the old nature. So you should be able to be basically sinless. Now, now Christians will constantly, well, I'm not saying you can be, you have to be sinless, but they then turn around and say, but you have the power of God. You can say no to sin. You can overcome temptation. You can follow God. You can obey God. You can obey all of his laws. So on one hand, we constantly preach that you can do it. But when it all explodes, and it all falls apart, and the building is on fire, and the scandal is everywhere, and now we go into damage control, then we always, evangelical Christianity always retreats to, well, we're not infallible. We're not perfect. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not sinless. We're sinners. Yet we always retreat to that. But maybe it, the problem is, maybe one of the causes of the issues in the church is because we can't be honest with the reality of what we are and who we are. And if you can't be, it's kind of like in, in any kind of an addiction program. You have to first acknowledge your problem, right? Hello, everyone. I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. Hello, everyone. I'm so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. You have to, you not, you start by letting everyone know your name and that you are an alcoholic. You are acknowledging and admitting your problem. You're admitting your, your issue. Well, the church is, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm a sinner who still has a depraved nature who still will continue to sin from this point on until I am glorified and receive a glorified body where the sinful nature is finally eradicated. Now, when you say that, people say, well, that's a defeated Christianity. That's a weak Christianity. We have power. We have power. We have the power of God living inside of us. Well, if we have the power of God living inside of us, then why? Why over and over and over in 2,000 years of church history, it's sin and brokenness and scandal and this and that. Why, why, why didn't Paul just tell the Corinthians, hey, guys, you shouldn't be having any problems with sin. You've got power. You can do it. The old is gone. No, he, he, he constantly just, he re- continues to refer to them as believers, but constantly rebuking and challenging them that they're not living in a correct way. So while I agree, hey, we're still sinners, don't you, you have to acknowledge, you have to take that reality and compare it to how Christians are taught. You're taught that you're a sinner, but for some magical way, because you are now saved, you're, you've got power over it. You can overcome it. So then everyone has to believe, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm more than a conqueror. I can do this. No, nothing can defeat me. I, 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 the old is completely gone. And we, we teach this in such a way, to not in relation to our position, but to our practical everyday life. And then the reality is sin, sin, church splits, fights, gossip, greed, gluttony, slothfulness lust. You just, it just shows up over and over and over, not only from the person standing behind the pulpit, from the people sitting in the pew. But nobody seems to be able to acknowledge that. But when it all, when the building is on fire, then we're like, hey, guys, guys, we're just sinners. Okay. So I don't know why you expect so much. And then once the scandal goes away and we put out the fire, then we go back to, we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do it. And then we go back to teaching that which never corresponds to the rea- reality that people actually exist. I think the biggest cause of it is we, we, uh, we are, are taught incorrectly about the reality of what we experience as Christians. The old nature is not gone. The old man is not gone. It's very much present in us. That's why we have to be saved by an imputed righteousness. And we have to struggle and strive, well, to try to live godly life. We should never excuse our sin by saying we're sinners, but it's the rea- you have to start with the reality. It's not an excuse. It's an acknowledgement of the truth. 
So I just thought that that was, I kind of, I kind of understood why they started there. They didn't really explain it much. Basically, they just simply said, hey, we're all sinners. So just, so the reason their abuse is rampant in the church is we are sinners. But they don't bother to deal with the fact that the church constantly almost denies that reality in its teaching. To me, that's the problem. All right, number two. We are taught forgiveness and grace. Our faith is one that emphasizes forgiveness and grace, which rightfully are key tenets of Christianity. We teach that women are to clothe themselves with gentleness, kindness, and patience. These are good qualities, essential qualities. The problem is that we fail to give any time to abuse and boundaries and toxicity. We fail to see that Jesus himself wasn't a doormat allowing others to walk on him. When he faced the Pharisees, he recognized the toxicity in their hearts and called them out on it. His words were not kind and gentle, but direct and truthful. He chose to put space between himself and those who were toxic to him and to his mission. We need to learn that boundaries and recognizing abusive, toxic behaviors are not contradictory to our faith. Instead, it can actually enhance our relationships with God. God. So this seems to say, and that's the whole section, that the prob- the reason abuse is so rampant is because we're taught forgiveness and grace. And because we're taught forgiveness and grace, then we just kind of overlook the abuse. We forgive the abuse, therefore allowing the abuse to continue to spread. So we need to have, we need to realize that there are boundaries. I, I guess maybe I can see that. I I, I would have to talk to a lot of uh, abuse victims and go, at any point in your experience, did you go, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to say anything because I have to forgive and I have to show grace. Now, there's probably, uh, uh, I'm assuming that the, 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 the ones, the abusers may have used that concept to protect themselves. You need to forgive me. You need to show grace. Possibly. I I don't know what to do with that because they don't really, they don't really expand on it. So we just, we need to learn that boundaries and recognizing abusive, toxic behaviors are not contradictory to our faith and said it can actually enhance our relationship with God. So we need to find boundaries and we must recognize abusive, toxic behaviors. Maybe the reason we can't, uh, we can't recognize abusive, toxic behaviors is because we taught that everyone in Christianity, well, they're a new creature and the old is completely gone. So they can't really be abusive or toxic, right? Because they're godly. And okay. Maybe, maybe have we taught, if we taught forgiveness and grace the wrong way, like it's almost like it's a weird, like the, the teaching of, Forgiveness and grace is the problem. I, I I don't. I can I can see how that doctrine can be abu- used, and people can use that doctrine to manipulate a victim to be silent. I do see that, and I do understand that. But that still would not that would explain how abusers get away with it. That would not really explain why abuse is so rampant in the church, unless you're saying, okay, abuse would not be rampant if we were taught correctly about forgiveness and grace because we could stop the spread of it quickly. Maybe that's the approach. Maybe maybe that's what they're saying. All right, number three. Our love for God encourages us always to do the right thing. Again, this is just a baffling to me that this is an article that sets out to tell us why abuse is so rampant. And I'm having a hard time processing each one of these. I'm trying my best to understand where they're coming. Let's see if this one, maybe this one makes more sense. So number three, the the reason abuse is so rampant in the church is because our love for God encourages us always to do the right thing. We sincerely desire to walk in obedience to God, to bring glory and honor to him. But sometimes our desire to do right actually causes us to become entrapped in unhealthy situations. So our desire to do right causes us to become entrapped in unhealthy situations. 
all right? When this woman experienced the situation she did with her husband, she remembered tearfully telling a friend that my biggest concern was the damage that we had inflicted on the name of Christ. The truth is, is that we had not done anything to damage the name of Christ. He had done something to damage, uh, damage God's name, but I was connected to him. I was his wife. And my desire to do the right thing, I had forgiven and forgiven and forgiven and forgiven again and failed to stand up to my husband. I was so intent on staying in my marriage because it was the right thing that I failed to see how walking away could actually be God's will. So many of us are actually incredibly devoted to our faith and we fear exposing our abusers will actually damage the name of Christ. It makes us, it makes it so much harder to walk away. All right. I don't know if that would be because we always want to do the right thing. Um, I don't, I I can't, this is just, it's written extremely odd. This would be, we have a, we have a, we, I don't know. We, how would we word this one? That the reason abusers get away with it is because the victims feel like they don't want to say anything because they don't want to hurt the name of Christ. Is, is that, is that, that that makes sense. I I guess you could say that what what they're trying to do the right thing. Okay. I I guess I can see how that, that would tie together, but it's, it's focused on the victims are, are so concerned with protecting the name of Christ that they won't do anything about it. Okay. That that makes that makes some sense. Yeah, that, that so someone just said uh, this is confusing, but maybe she's offering her own personal experience as to why she stayed in a bad situation. That's what it appears. This is simply her taking like, hey, why why is it rampant in the church? Well, here is why I stayed in a bad situation. Uh, like maybe this should be maybe this should be entitled why I stayed in an abusive situation. Maybe that's what, how the, this is not really answering why abuse is rampant in the church. Maybe it should be this. This is why I stayed in an abusive situation, allowing the abuse to continue. All right. Maybe that's what this should be called. And then people can extrapolate from that. Maybe that maybe one of the reasons abuse spreads in the church is because victims are like, hey, I don't want to hurt the name of Christ. I don't want to hurt the name of Christ. I don't want to hurt the name of Christ. There may that may be true. And again, that doesn't explain why the abuse starts in the first place. Why why there's so much abuse starting in the church? This would simply say this is why it continues to spread, right? So I'm trying to like I'm still trying to get that. Why is it happening? Why is it happening? Um, and this seems to be saying why nothing is done about it. Uh, yeah, m- yeah, m- m- the, the person may be trying to speak for other victims too. P- possibly. I, I, I'm still just... I, again, it's hard to know how many victims are like, hey, the reason I didn't say anything. Because what we seem to, uh, if I remember correctly, one of the biggest issues... At least in, and I can't say in every case, but in many cases, the victims did try to speak out. The victims did try to do something about it and they were silenced. So it didn't seem like the victims were like, hey, I've got to forgive. Hey, I've got to, I can't, I don't want to hurt the name of Christ. It seems like that many of the victims tried to speak up and they were silenced. In fact, remember the very headline, the very headline this article begins with, when, when the author describes the, the news article that she saw on her phone, and I quote the, the article headline, Bo- uh, bombshell 400-page report finds Southern Baptist leaders routinely silenced sexual abuse survivors. They were trying to speak up, but they were silenced. This seems to argue that the reason it runs rampant is because the survivors will not speak up because they've been taught to forgive and they've been taught to do the right thing, meaning don't hurt the name of Christ. But if the victims were trying to speak up, that goes against the very argument that goes against the very argument you're putting forth as the reason why it spread. The reason it spread is because the survivors were silenced. The, the, there was cover up. The survivors were basically, be quiet, right? As in the the horrible situation that happened at John MacArthur's church. Here's a woman who's being abused. She goes to the church. 
the church tells her to do something that the church uh, and that she doesn't want to go along with that. She doesn't want to go back to be with her husband because there was abuse and the church excommunicates her. And then she finds out and then she finds out that her children are being sexually abused by that man. He goes to prison and the church still won't even lift her her excommunication. That's silencing the woman and protecting the man. That's that that doesn't seem to fit with this. Um Someone just said, well, and maybe she's trying to say it more, that if more people spoke up sooner or left or whatever, it wouldn't be so rapid. Maybe that's her perspective. <laughs> I appreciate the person trying to offer me help here because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little baffled by it as well. I just think that we've got ex- clear cases where they tried to speak up and they're silenced by the power structure, the power structure in place, the power structure that's supposed to provide accountability and protection turns into a protection racket, protecting the church and its leadership and and maintaining the bottom line. I mean, when when a woman is being abused and somehow she finds herself the one excommunicated, the abuser is not excommunicated. The abuser goes to prison for sexually, uh, sexually molesting children and the church still supports the man in prison and won't lift the excommunication of the woman. That that's the problem. The woman did speak up and the woman was silenced by the power structure. It becomes a protection racket. It's like the mafia. You don't go against the structure. You will be silenced. You will be crushed. You will be destroyed. That, that, I mean, the, the MacArthur case shows someone (laughs) who, who did, they, the person trying to speak up is the one who got excommunicated. I mean, that story is insanity. So I, I, I understand what she's trying to do. And, and I'm not, look, I'm not saying that there aren't victims out there who, who are told, hey, you, you show grace and forgiveness. Hey, you don't want to hurt the name of Christ, so you be quiet. I think that these are concepts that are used by the, abu- by the, one, by the abuser to manipulate the abused. I think that that is very true. So there is some element, and each one of these points, there's an element of truth to it. I mean, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I don't want to be unfair, but I, I don't know if they really answer to why the abuse is rampant, right? There are some issues here. It's almost like we need to take what she has said and try to rework it and go, how can we include these in something that would make a little bit more sense? And then here's the last one. Spiritual abuse includes twisting scripture subtly to make it sound biblical. So the reason abuse is so rampant in the church is because spiritual abuse includes the twisting of scripture because scripture is being twisted. Now, this is very interesting. I'm going to do something really quick. I'm going to open up the Spreaker app just because I may miss uh, comments. If, and I don't want to miss any here when we get to this point. All right, here we go. All right, let's go through this one. This is, this is what, now this is the longest point of all the points that are made in the article. This is the, like, the, this is the one that gets the most, most words are dedicated to this point, which would seem to indicate in my mind that the author thinks this is the, here's the reason, here's the reason. All right, so number four. Spiritual abuse includes twisting scripture subtly to make it sound biblical. Remember the serpent in Genesis? It didn't come up with some outlandish claim to distract Eve and said it was a subtle change to God's words. Did God really say? Abusive spiritual leaders often know scripture and are capable of subtly twisting it to make it seem sound and biblical. They have uh, often already gained their victim's trust through their charisma and the persona they portray. They usually have command of the scriptures, and we rarely question or doubt their authority on the scripture. It makes it fairly easy for them to gently groom their victims and convince them that their view of scripture is not fully correct. All right. Now, there's far more here, but I got to stop right here. And I, and I just got to try to process this. Now, number one, there's no doubt that, that many abuse victims have fallen for an, a manipulative spiritual leader 
who uses scripture in such a way to justify their sexual abuse, defend themselves, or to protect themselves. I completely agree. I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying that doesn't happen. But I do have to kind of raise my hand here a little bit, just from what I have seen and all of my years within Christianity. I have seen over and over within Christianity that people within 10 seconds will disagree with a pastor, disagree with the way he preaches a sermon, disagree with an interpretation. Men, women, teenagers disagree, disagree, and they will, they don't feel at all bound to have to go with the pastor's teaching. They don't have to go along with it in any way, shape, or form. So why is it that in sexual abuse cases, somehow, hey, you know, the, the, the pastor convinced me that they were right and that I was wrong and I had to go along with it. I just, it just seems odd to me when every time you turn around, uh, no, I, I, we went to this church and that pastor was just wrong. So we went and found another church or, or no, now we just go to home church because we don't think all the churches are messed up. I mean, I get, I get emails constantly or comments on YouTube, wherever from female listeners who tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. So they don't, they don't see, I don't, I've never had any going, you know what? Whatever you say is right. No, I, I, it just seems like a weird, like, so they, they know scripture so well, the women don't. And then the women are manipulated into going along with us to, to being manipulated and groomed so that they are abused sexually because of the twisting of scripture. It it just, I I can, unless I understand this argument in a Catholic perspective, right? Because, well, the church is the authority. They have magisterial authority. They're the only ones who can interpret the Bible. I could understand it in that setting, but the Protestant thing is scripture and scripture alone. We can disagree. We can disagree. We can disagree. But I, I do believe that this would be attempted and tried. I'm not saying that, I'm not denying that there's not an element to it. It just seems odd that I've seen so much disagreement well, wrong, 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 wrong. I mean, all the time. But it, it, so I, I don't know. Let, let they go on. All right. Here's what they say. They, they go on. Think about submission. How many times have we heard that a wife is to submit to her husband? The man who takes that scripture out of the greater context and uses it to control his wife is guilty of twisting scripture. The truly godly man will recognize that submission is a two-way street, that it must be tempered with a lot of wonderful qualities of Christianity, forgiveness, grace, patience, and tender-hearted mercy. It's not an opportunity for the man to exercise control, but is instead an act of respect and putting others ahead of ourselves. Sadly, abuse in the SBC and the church in general is real and damaging. It's time we empower our, the faithful with the truth, the truth that people are sinners, the truth that our faith leads itself to missing toxic and abusive behaviors, the truth that we can get caught up in doing the right thing for God and failing to see how we are easily being led astray. We must learn that Jesus didn't always offer grace. We must learn that Jesus didn't always offer grace. Grace. Sometimes he chose to walk away from those religious folks who were toxic and abusive. Jesus didn't always offer grace. He chose to walk away from those religious folks who were toxic and abusive. trying to wrap my mind around that. When he hung on the cross, even the people who crucified, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's a time Jesus stopped offering grace. There was times he he rebuked, but are you saying that the rebuke was not ultimately a, a rebuke in order to offer? I mean, rebuke sometimes comes before grace, but are you saying he he just stopped offering grace? That is a yeah. I'm a I I don't even know I don't even know what I don't how do I process this? I, I'm still trying to process the twisting scripture thing. 
Right? So look, so if you think the twisting of scripture, now, now okay, well, well, before we get to the, the stuff, I, man, I'm, I'm completely baffled here. I am completely baffled here. Okay, let's go back to the twisting scripture thing. Let's say this is true. The reason sexual abuse has been rampant in the church is because pastors twist scriptures. All right, then what I would suggest is the solution is that every church has to teach their people hermeneutics biblical interpretational principles, Bible study skills, and that they, they that the church needs to become better equipped at that. Now, the problem is a lot of people who say, well, the, 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 the pastors are twisting scriptures. They're the last one who wants the church to turn into basically a small seminary. They would be like, I don't like this. I don't like this. I want a church where it's different. Well, if you want to fix the problem, the church has to become a, a mini seminary so that people, that the average woman sitting in the pew knows how to interpret scripture, how to process and analyze a sermon, how to and, and realize when scripture is being t- twisted, when scripture is being taken out of context, that they know how to check context. They know how to study. They know how to look up the Greek. They know how to look up the Hebrew. They, they know all the different interpretive methods. They they have to be qualified to do that. So if, if that is what you think is the problem, is that women are getting manipulated because the pastors know scripture better than the women. What I've found in many cases, the women know scriptures better than the pastors is what I've typically found. I've typically found that women are the ones who typically study the Bible and have a greater understanding of what it actually says. That That's what I've always witnessed. So uh, that's that's just baffling. So, okay, so, so what, so if that's the, what's your solution then? The solution has to be, okay, women, you've got to know the, you got to protect yourself. Your, your, your protection is, you know, the Bible, you know it, you read it, you know it, you know it. And then, and in the Protestant world, isn't that always the answer? Then the, and the answer always is there's false teachers. There's men who will creep in unawares, who will lead people astray, who will deceive Isn't that always the warning in scripture? And what is the solution? The solution is you. You have a responsibility to learn it. You have the responsibility to know it. You have the responsibility that no one can manipulate you with it. Like if that's the problem, well, then there's a, there's a fix, but the fix is going to dramatically decrease the size of most churches because most people don't want that kind of in-depth teaching working through scripture, giving people homework and say, let's work on this. Let's work on this. No, 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 no. They don't want that. Well, if nobody wants that, then what's the solution? Hey, the abusers twist scripture. That's the problem. Okay. So are you going to just tell all the abusers, stop twisting scripture, stop twisting scripture, stop it, stop it. Now I want right now, I don't know if you can hear behind me, My neighbor is mowing the lawn. I want to open up my window and say, stop it, stop it. I'm trying to do a broadcast, dude. That's important. Okay, just I have to explain what that sound is in the background. It's really loud. Okay, but uh, so if 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 we go with the number four, that's the one she dedicated the most time to. I agree. Let's say that twisting scripture is the reason why sexual abuse is so rampant in the church. Then the only solution is full blown hermeneutical studies so that everyone in the church is a Bible study expert. They are, they are so equipped that no one can ever manipulate the scripture against them again, ever, ever. And it would be interesting to, to hear what church, what preaching this woman listens to that she thinks is so good, because what I bet you find, I bet you in some of the sermons that I could be wrong, but I bet you in some of the sermons possibly she listens to, I bet you're like, well, that's twisting. Look, there's twisting. I want to make sure this is very important. Twisting scripture doesn't just lead to sexual abuse. Twisting scripture involves all kinds of well, hermeneutical abuses, twisting, abusing the scripture, theological abuse. There's lots of twisting. Of, like, not all twisting scripture just simply leads to sexual abuse. The key is you have to then be prepared to deal with all twisting of scripture, all of it. So if that's the problem, we can work on a tangible solution there. But I guarantee you 90% of churches will not implement it in any way, shape, or form. They're going to continue with their little three-point sermons, ripping verses out of context, and nobody and nobody's going to be bothered by it. So if that's the problem, then we got to put up. Now, I'm still baffled here by the last comment. 
or by the last statement. This is the very last sentence of the entire article that supposedly explains why abuse is so rampant. We must learn that Jesus didn't always offer grace, period. Jesus didn't always offer grace. And the best example she provided in there is when he, he, he rebuked the Pharisees. But you're telling me that if they would have repented or if they would have acknowledged their sin, he wouldn't have offered them grace? And again, he, he, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Who was, he, who was he praying that prayer of forgiveness to? Just the people who drove the nails in or for everyone who ultimately worked to put him on that cross? When, when Judas got ready to kiss him, did he not refer to him as friend? Like, I, I, is, is it the grace of God extended to, uh, to the very worst of sinners? Are you saying that the, the grace of God is not extended to an abuser? Hey, if you're an abuser, there's no grace for you. Now, extending grace doesn't mean you don't have to go to the authorities and report it to the authorities if there was sexual, because that's a crime. That has to be, right? I'm not saying that there, there has to still be something done about it, but there still has to be grace. I, I don't understand that. And that he, Jesus walked away from religious folk who were toxic and abusive. Did Jesus walk away from them or did they walk away from Jesus? I'm, I, I'm baffled by this. I'm baffled by this. I, I don't know what else to say. I, 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 nobody else. The, the last comment I got was, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. I'm kind of like, what? I, 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 I don't, I, I don't know. So I, we're at 52 minutes. Again, the reason I wanted to look at this article is because it, a headline and hey, here's why it's running rampant. And I, I'm trying to I, look. I think that some of the things they said are very profound and true. We would just have to rework it in a way saying in abuse situations, sometimes these things are present, but that still would not explain the why. To the two best are people are sinners, which I agree with. But I think the problem is, to me, that the church teaches that, yeah, you're a sinner, but really, you can overcome that sin, and so everyone has to pretend that they basically are sinless. I think that's the real problem. She didn't address that. And then number the fourth one was, they twist scriptures, and women are manipulated by it, and women are groomed by it, because they don't know the scriptures as well as the pastors. All right, well, then the solution there is we need women to be better equipped in handling the scriptures. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that's the only solution, obviously. Obviously, I'm not saying, you know, don't find the abuser and, and, and do something about the abuser. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if this is the, that's the one she dedicated the most time to, well, then by all means, we have to do that. Now, there's no easy way to solve the problem Trying to think of the victim. Like, I, there's no, I mean, because in many cases, the victims, at, at least in the news article that she was citing as what led to her to write this article, that that stated that the, the survivors were silenced by the church. Not that the survivors silenced themselves. The survivors wanted to speak out. But there's no easy way to tell. I think sometimes survivors don't, I, look, I think there's a lot of reasons why a survivor doesn't speak out, right? They don't speak out maybe because of, of shame, the, the, of just embarrassment or, or a fear of retaliation from the abuser. There could be lots. I don't know if the reasons are, well, I, I was taught to have, you know, forgiveness and grace, and I was taught to do the right thing, and the right thing is not to hurt the name of Christ. I can understand that. You would also think that the abuse, uh, the abused woman, if they want to do the right thing, would also be motivated to do the right thing would be to do what's necessary to protect other women from the same abuse. But so, I mean, you could argue that doing the right thing would actually lead to Christian women speaking up. 
So you could, I mean, you could go a lot of different ways with this. I, I'm just, I'm just really kind of just, I don't understand the last part. Jesus basically stopped offering grace and walked away from abusive, toxic people. I thought he died for abusive, toxic people, right? I mean, is it for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish by every last life? Life isn't the offer of God's grace extended to everyone? Doesn't mean that excuses the abuse or it should be overlooked or, or criminal charges should not be, you know, sought out. There you have it. it, it it's a kind of an interesting... I, we're at 55 minutes, so I have to stop. I, I'm still just trying to process it all. I'm still trying to process it all. What I would challenge you to do, you can go to, you should be able to find it at crosswalk.com. If you can't find the article, email me, newsif at yahoo.com. You, by all means, look at the article and try to maybe flesh out, like, in your mind, just your own personal opinion, why do you think it's so rampant in the church? And I think everyone's going to have very differing perspectives, right? I think a woman may have a different perspective than a man. Someone who has suffered abuse is going to have a different perspective than someone who hasn't. So I, I, but I think as individual Christians, it's something we have to ask, why? Why, why is, what's happening? What is going on? 